Good morning, and Merry Christmas to all of you. Welcome to worship this morning, a special welcome to those who are joining us online, and to anyone who is a guest here at St. John's. We're grateful for your presence to be with us in worship this morning. Uh, one note is during the time of communion, uh, if you would prefer uh, a gluten-free or uh, gluten-free wafer, please give us one finger up to our server and we will give you a gluten-free wafer. Also, we have pre-packaged communion in the back for folks who are uh, concerned about uh, COVID uh, issues. Uh, there is gluten-free and wine, gluten-free and grape juice, regular and wine, and regular bread and grape juice. So uh, please know that that is all available. Now I invite you to please stand as you are able as we begin our worship with a confession and forgiveness. We gather as we live in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us confess our sins before God and one another. We keep a moment of silence for our own private prayers of confession. Most merciful God, we confess that we are captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for you, and for his sake, God forgives you all your sins. As a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ and by his authority, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all your sins, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And together we sing our gathering song, Hark the Herald Angels Sing.
the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all.
Our lesson today is from John 1, 19 to 34. This is the testimony given by John when the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, Who are you? He confessed and did not deny it, but confessed, I am not the Messiah. And they asked him, What then? Are you Elijah? He said, I am not. Are you the prophet? He answered, No. Then he said to them, said to him, Who are you? Let us have an answer for those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? He said, I am the voice of one crying out in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah said. Now they had been sent from the Pharisees. They asked him, Why then are you baptizing if you are neither the Messiah nor Elijah nor the prophet? John answered them, I baptize with water. Among you stands one whom you do not know, the one who is coming after me. I am not worthy to untie the thong of his sandal, this took place in Bethany across the Jordan where John was baptizing. The next day, he saw Jesus coming toward him and declared, Here is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, After me comes a man who ranks ahead of me because he was before me. Myself did not know him. But I came baptizing with water for this reason, that he might be revealed to Israel. And John testified, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and it remained on him. Myself did not know him, but the one who sent me to baptize with water said to me, He on whom you see the Spirit descend and remain is the one who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I myself have seen and have testified that this is the Son of God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, today is, uh, everybody gets to be children today. Uh, both for the children's message and the sermon. So if there's kids that want to come down, you certainly can. Or if you're feeling light at heart, Dave, you, wanna, you can come sit. So if you were here at the 10 o'clock service, you're going to be for a treat. Steve, Marianne, you guys are, uh, in case you fell asleep the first time, you'll be all right. So um, one of the tradition, traditions that my grandfather, who is a retired pastor, had uh, is that around Christmas time, whether it be uh, a 10 o'clock service on Christmas Eve, a Christmas morning, or a Sunday after Christmas, to read a book for the sermon. And it was a tradition that he had for 30-some years, and it became, a lot of, well, uh, for a grandchild, but also for members of his congregation, uh, a gift in many respects. So uh, if you've heard this book before, like if you were here at 10 o'clock at Christmas Eve, you're going to hear it again. But otherwise... This book is called The Christmas Miracle of Jonathan Toomey. And if you'd like to move to be able to see the pictures a little better, you can. The village children called him Mr. Gloomy, but in fact his name was Toomey, Mr. Jonathan Toomey. And though it's not kind to call people names, this one fit quite well. For Jonathan Toomey seldom smiled and never laughed. He went about mumbling and grumbling, muttering and sputtering, grumping and griping. He complained that the church bells rang too often, that the birds sang too shrilly, and the children played too loudly. Mr. Toomey was a woodcarver. Some said he was the best woodcarver in the whole valley. He spent his days sitting at a workbench carving beautiful shapes from blocks of pine and hickory and chestnut wood. After supper, he sat in a straight-backed chair near the fireplace, smoking his pipe and staring into the flames. 
Jonathan Toomey wasn't an old man, but if you saw him, you might think he was, the way he walked, bent forward with his head down. You wouldn't notice his eyes, the clear blue of an August sky, and you wouldn't see the dimple on his chin since his face was mostly hidden under a shaggy, untrimmed beard speckled with sawdust and wood shavings, and depending what he ate that day, with crumbs of bread or a bit of potato or dried gravy. The village people didn't know it, but there was a reason for his gloom, a reason for his grumbling, a reason why he walked hunched over as if carrying a great weight on his shoulders. Some years earlier, when Jonathan Toomey was young and full of life and full of love, his wife and baby had become very sick, and because those were the days before hospitals and medicines and skilled doctors, his wife and baby died, three days apart from each other. So Jonathan Toomey had packed his belongings into a wagon and traveled until his tears stopped. He settled into a tiny house at the edge of a village to do his wood carving. One day in early December, there was a knock at Jonathan's door. I forgot to show you the picture, didn't I? My kids get mad at me for that, too. I get so wrapped up into it. One day in early December, there was a knock at Jonathan's door. Mumbling and grumbling, he went to answer it. There stood a woman and a young boy. I'm the widow McDowell. I'm new in your village. This is my son, Thomas, the woman said. I'm seven, and I know how to whistle, said Thomas. Whistling is pish posh, said the woodcarver gruffly. I I need something carved, said the woman. And she told Jonathan about a very special set of Christmas figures her grandfather had carved for her when she was a girl. After I moved here, I discovered that they were lost, she explained. I had hoped that by some miracle I would find them again, but it hasn't happened. There is no such things as miracles, the woodcarver told her. Now, could you describe the figures for me? Well, there were sheep, she told him. Two of them with curly wool, added Thomas. Yes, two, said the widow, and a cow, and, and a cow, an angel, Mary, Joseph, the baby Jesus, and the wise men. Three of them, added Thomas. Will you take the job, asked the widow McDowell. I will. Well, I'm grateful. And how soon can you have them ready? They will be ready when they are ready, he said. But I must have them by Christmas. They mean very much to me. I can't remember a Christmas without them. Christmas, Christmas is pish posh, said Jonathan gruffly. And he shut the door. The following week, there was a knock at the woodcarver's door. Muttering and sputtering, he went to answer it. There stood the widow McDowell and Thomas. Excuse me, the widow, said the widow, but Thomas has been begging to come and watch you work. He says he wants to be a woodcarver when he grows up and would like to watch you since you are the best in the valley. I'll be quiet. You, you won't even know I'm here. Please, please, piped in Thomas. With a grumble, the woodcarver stepped aside to let them in. He pointed to a stool near his workbench. No talking, no jiggling, no noise, he ordered Thomas. The widow McDowell handed Mr. Toomey a warm loaf of cornbread as a token of thanks. Then she took out her knitting and sat down in a rocking chair in the far corner of the cottage. Not there! bellowed the woodcarver. No one sits in that chair. So she moved to the straight-backed chair by the fire. Thomas sat very still. Once when he needed to sneeze, he pressed a finger under his nose to hold it back. Once when he wanted desperately to scratch his leg, he counted to 20 to keep his mind off the itch. After a very long time, Thomas cleared his throat and whispered, Mr. Toomey, uh, may I ask you a question? The woodcarver glared at Thomas, then shrugged his shoulders and grunted. Thomas decided it, it meant yes, so he went on. Well, is, is that my sheep you're carving? The woodcarver carver nodded and grunted again. After another very long time, Thomas whispered, Mr. Toomey, excuse me, but 
you're carving my sheep wrong. The widow McDowell's knitting needles stopped clicking. Jonathan Toomey's knife stopped carving, and Thomas went on. It's a beautiful sheep, nice and curly, but, but my sheep looked happy. That's pish posh, said Mr. Toomey. Sheep are sheep, they cannot look happy. But mine did, answered Thomas. They knew they were with baby Jesus, so they were happy. After that, Thomas was quiet for the rest of the afternoon. When the church bells chimed six o'clock, Mr. Toomey grumbled under his breath about the awful noise. The widow McDowell said it was time to leave. Thomas sneezed three times and then thanked the woodcarver for allowing him to watch. That evening, after a supper of cornbread and boiled potatoes, the woodcarver sat down at his bench. He picked up his knife. He picked up the sheep. He worked until his eyelids drooped shut. A few days later, there was a knock at the woodcarver's door. Griping and grumbling, he went to answer it. There stood the widow and her son. May I watch again? I'll be quiet, said Thomas. He settled himself on the stool very quietly while his mother laid a basket of sweet-smelling raisin buns on the table. The teapot is warm, Mr. Toomey said gruffly, his head bent over his work. While Mr. Toomey carved, the widow McDowell poured tea. She touched the woodcarver gently on the shoulder and placed a cup of tea in a bun next to him. He pretended not to notice, but soon both the plate and the cup were empty. Thomas tried to eat the bun his mother had given him as quietly as he could, but it's almost impossible to be seven and eat a warm, sticky raisin bun without making various smacking, licking, and satisfied noises. When Thomas had finished, he tried to sit quietly. Once he almost hiccuped, but he took a deep breath and held it until his face turned red. And once, without thinking, he began to swing his legs, but a glare from the woodcarver stopped him, and he kept them so still that they began to fall asleep. After a very long time, Thomas whispered, Mr. Toomey, uh, excuse me, may I ask a question? Grunt. Is that my cow you're carving? Nod and a grunt. Another very long time went by, and then Thomas cleared his throat and said, Mr. Toomey, excuse me, but I must tell you something. That's really a beautiful cow, the most beautiful cow I've ever seen, but it's not right. My cow looked proud. That's pish posh, growled the woodcarver. Cows are cows, they cannot look proud. But my cow did. It knew that Jesus chose to be born in its barn, so it was proud. Thomas was quiet for the rest of the afternoon. The only sounds that could be heard were the scraping of the carving knife, the humming of the widow McDowell, and the click-click of her knitting needles. When the church bells chimed six o'clock, Mr. Toomey muttered under his breath about the noise. The widow McDowell said it was time to leave. Thomas shook first one leg and then the other. He thanked the woodcarver for allowing him to watch. That evening, after a supper of boiled potatoes and raisin buns, the woodcarver sat down at his bench. He picked up his carving knife, he picked up the cow, he worked until his eyelids drooped shut. A few days later, there was a knock on the woodcarver's door. He smoothed down his hair as he went to answer it. At the door were the widow and her son. May I watch again, asked Thomas, as Mrs. McDowell warmed the teapot and put a plate of fresh molasses cookies on the workbench. Thomas watched the woodcarver work on the figure of an angel, and after a long time, Thomas spoke. Mr. Toomey, excuse me, is that my angel you're carving? Yes, and would you do me the favor of telling me exactly what I'm doing wrong? Well, my angel looked like one of God's most important angels because... It was sent to baby Jesus. And just how does one make an angel look important? Asked the woodcarver. You'll be able to do it, said Thomas. You're the best woodcarver in the valley. After another very long time, Thomas spoke. Mr. Toomey, excuse me, may I ask a question? Do you ever stop talking? Asked the woodcarver. My mother says I don't. She says I could learn about the virtue of silence from you. Under his beard, the woodcarver's face turned pink. 
The widow McDowell's face turned as red as the scarf she was knitting. Well, speak up. What's your question? Will you please teach me to carve? I'm a very busy man, grumbled the woodcarver. But he put down the important angel. You will carve a bird. A robin, I hope, said Thomas. I like robins. <clears throat> With a piece of charcoal, the woodcarver sketched a robin on a piece of brown paper. He handed Thomas a small block of pine and a knife. He showed him how to lop the corners from the block and slowly smooth the edges of the wood into curves. Thomas copied the woodcarver's strokes, head bent, tongue working from side to side of his lower lip as he concentrated. When the church bells chimed six o'clock, Jonathan Toomey was holding Thomas's hand in his, guiding the knife along the edge of a wing. He didn't hear them ringing. The widow McDowell said it was time to leave, so Thomas brushed wood shavings from his shirt, and then he reached out and brushed two especially large pieces of wood shaving from Jonathan Toomey's beard. He thanked the woodcarver for teaching him how to carve. Later, after a supper of boiled potatoes and molasses cookies, Jonathan Toomey went to his workbench. He thought for a long time. He sketched drawing after drawing. Finally, he picked up his carving knife. He picked up the angel. He carved until his eyelids drooped shut. A few days later, there was a knock on the woodcarver's door. Mr. Toomey jumped up to answer it. There stood the widow McDowell with a bouquet of pine boughs and holly sprigs dotted with berries. And there stood Thomas clutching his partly carved robin. While Thomas and Mr. Toomey carved, Mrs. McDowell put the bouquet in a jar of water. She scrubbed Mr. Toomey's kitchen table and set the jar in the center on a pretty cloth embroidered with lilies of the valley and daisies, which she found in a drawer, drawer below the cupboard. Next, I will carve the wise men and Joseph, the woodcarver said to Thomas. Perhaps before I begin, you will tell me about all the mistakes I'm going to make. Well, said Thomas, my wise men were wearing their most wonderful robes because they were going to visit Jesus. And my Joseph, well, my Joseph was leaning over baby Jesus like, like he was protecting him. He looked very serious. Now, it wasn't until the church bells had chimed and the widow and her son were preparing to go that Mr. Toomey saw the jar of pine bows that, and the scrubbed table and the cloth embroidered with lilies of the valley and daisies. I found the cloth in a drawer. I, I thought it would look pretty on the table, the widow McDowell said, smiling. Never open that drawer, the woodcarver said harshly. When the two had left, Jonathan put the cloth away. That evening after supper of boiled potatoes, the woodcarver worked on Joseph and the wise men until his eyelids drooped shut. A few days later, there was a knock on the woodcarver's door. He dusted the crumbs from his beard and brushed the sawdust from his shirt. At the door were the widow McDowell and Thomas. All afternoon, Thomas watched the woodcarver work. When it was time to leave, Jonathan said to Thomas, I'm about to begin the last two figures, Mary and the baby. Can you tell me how your figures look? Well, they were the most special of all, said Thomas. Jesus was smiling and reaching up to his mother, and, and Mary, Mary looked like she loved him so very much. Thank you, Thomas, said the woodcarver. Well, tomorrow is Christmas. Is there any chance the figures will be ready? The widow McDowell asked. They will be ready when they are ready. I understand, said the widow, and she handed Jonathan two packages. Merry Christmas, she said. Jonathan folded his arms across his chest. I want no presents, he said harshly. That is exactly why we are giving them, answered the widow. She put them down on the table and left. Jonathan sat down at the table. Slowly, he opened the first package. Inside was a red scarf, hand-knit warm and bright. He tied the scarf around his neck. The other package held a robin, crudely carved of pine. A smile twitched at the corners of Jonathan's mouth as he ran his fingers over the lopsided wings. He dusted the fireplace mantle with his sleeve and placed the robin exactly in the center so he could look at it from his chair. The woodcarver did not eat supper that day.
The woodcarver did not eat supper that day. Instead, he began to sketch the final figures, Mary and Jesus. He drew Mary, then wadded the sketch into a ball, then tossed it on the floor. He drew the baby, wadded the sketch into a ball, and tossed it with the first. He sketched again, and once more he crumpled the paper. Soon there was a small mountain of crumpled papers at his feet. He picked up a block of wood and tried to carve, but his knife would not do what he wanted it to do. He hurled the chunk of wood into the fireplace and sat staring into the flames. When he heard the church bells announcing the midnight Christmas service, he got up. Slowly, he opened the drawer beneath the cupboard, the drawer he had told the widow never to open. From it, he took the cloth embroidered with lilies of the valley and daisies. He took a rough wooden shawl and a lace handkerchief. He took out a tiny white baby blanket and a little pair of blue socks. He placed each piece gently on the floor. And from the bottom of the drawer, he lifted out a picture frame beautifully carved of deep brown chestnut wood. In the frame was a charcoal sketch of a woman sitting in a rocking chair holding a baby. The baby's arms were reaching up, touching the woman's face. The woman was looking down at the baby, smiling. Jonathan sat down in his rocking chair and held the picture against his chest. He rocked slowly, his eyes closed. Two, two tears trailed into his beard. When he finally took the picture to his workbench, and he began to carve. His fingers worked quickly and surely. He carved all through the night. The next day, there was a knock on the window of McDowell's door. When she opened it, there stood the woodcarver his neck wrapped in a red scarf holding a wooden box stuffed with straw. Mr. Toomey, said the widow, what a surprise, Merry Christmas. The figures are ready, he said as he stepped inside. From the box, Jonathan unpacked two curly sheep, happy sheep, because they were with Jesus. He unpacked a proud cow and an angel, a very important angel with mighty wings stretching from its shoulders right down to the hem of its gown. He unpacked three wise men wearing their most wonderful robes, edged with fur and falling in rich folds. He unpacked a serious and caring Joseph. He unpacked Mary wearing a rough woolen shawl, looking down, loving her precious baby son. Jesus was smiling and reaching up to touch his mother's face. That day, Jonathan went to the Christmas service with the widow McDowell and Thomas. And that day, in the churchyard, the village children saw Jonathan throw back his head, showing his eyes as clear as an August sky, and laugh. No one ever called him Mr. Gloomy again. The end.
I invite you to please stand as you are able. We pray for the church, the world, and all those in need. thanks for wonderful partners who bail pastors out when they are missing their batteries. <laughs> and we also give you thanks for the blessings of this past 12 months. And thanks for bringing us through the challenges and grief. Restore our joy and join with us as the clocks turn to a new moment, a new year, a new day to rise in praise of you, transforming God, hear our prayer. Reveal your, or heal your wounded people, Lord, longing for relief and aching for your presence. We offer up special petitions this day for Celeste and Chris Strand, for Glenn and Iona Rosen, uh, Rosenberg, Jenny Klein, Sally Mazingo, Burnett Heinrich, Maynard Nelson, Nilsson, Cecil Meningo, Gary Geisinger, Jay Larson, Jolene Davidson, Harlan Meyer, Marilyn Nilsson, Sherilyn Peterson, Russ Olsten, Orston, Lori Daudry, and those we name silent before you. We lift up to you the family and friends of Elizabeth Olson as they grieve her death. Transforming God, hear our prayer. With John and all of the trailblazing saints, we dare to proclaim the one who comes to shake the very foundations of the earth and yet gladly gathers us together and calls us brothers and sisters. Transforming God, hear our prayer. In all that we pray that you have heard, all that we... Excuse me, let me do that again. All that we pray you have heard, all that we need you have provided, join us in spirit with those for whom we pray and make us one people. In your holy name, amen. Please be seated at this time. We receive our morning's offering. Also, we will have the joyful jar uh, placed out in front as well.
pray together. Good and loving God, we rejoice in the birth of Jesus, who came among the poor to the bring the riches of your grace. As you have blessed us with your gifts, let them be a blessing for others. In Jesus' name, amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread. He gave thanks and broke it, gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Again, after the supper, Jesus took the cup. He gave thanks and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this in remembrance of me. Lord, remember us in your love, teaching us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The gifts of God are for the people of God. All are invited and welcome to come receive the gift of our Lord Jesus. You may be seated.
The body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you forever in his precious grace. Amen. Let us pray. Radiant God, with our eyes we have seen your salvation, and in this meal we have feasted on your grace. May your word take flesh in us, that we may be your holy people, revealing your glory made known to us in Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Please be seated for a few brief announcements. Again, a very Merry Christmas to all of you. We have a, an abbreviated schedule this week because of the Christmas holidays. Our office will be closed tomorrow here at St. John's. And so uh, please know if you come to church here, no one is going to be here uh, to, to warmly and welcomely uh, welcome you. Uh, but come Tuesday, we will be. And so we know many folks want to get in uh, year-end gifts, which are important to us here at St. John's. And so please, um, please make sure that those gifts come to, to St. John's uh, before the end of the year. Also, speaking of gifts, uh, we have our gratitude wall yet, or our wall of gratitude. Uh, many of the envelopes are gone, but there are still numbers of envelopes left if you have not made a wall of gratitude gift yet to help us pay off the mortgage in February. We want to encourage you to do that. Uh, please uh, grab a, an envelope and you can send it back in or drop it off here at church or place it in the offering on Sunday mornings. Uh, also, we are in need of people to sign up to be worship assistants. We thank our worship assistants today and uh, we ask that uh, you sign up and help us uh, as we lead worship here, whether it's working in the tech booth or it is uh, helping serve communion, we need people to sign up for Altar Guild and also to be readers of our lessons. Those are all our announcements. Now I invite you to please stand for our blessing. Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, bless you now and forever. Amen. And together we sing joy to the world.
with open arms to all. Together we live and share the love of Jesus. Go in peace and serve the Lord someplace else.